Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fireside Chicago, where we host Fireside Chats with prominent leaders from Chicago's business community, live on Zoom with Q&A every Tuesday and Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. I'm your host, Tim Shum. I'm also the founder and president of Lucas James Talent Partners, a recruitment firm here in town. Shout out to the Lucas James Talent Partners team, fighting the good fight on the personal and business front. Uh, at home for the most part, mostly in the Chicagoland area. Uh, we have a fantastic guest today, Samara Mejia Hernandez. She's the founding partner of Chingana Ventures. Uh, before we get to chatting with Samara, I just want to highlight some of the guests that we have for the remainder of June. Uh, this Thursday, June 11th, we have Dr. Rahul Kari, uh, founder and CEO of Innovative Care. If you haven't heard of Innovative Care, it's an urgent care facility in Lincoln Park. It's also one of the first COVID testing facilities in the city of Chicago. Dr. Kairi is a 20-year emergency room doctor, vet turned entrepreneur, and he's been at the forefront on the ground of this COVID thing from the start. If you're interested in what's happening in Chicago with COVID, he's the guy to talk to. So make sure to tune in next Thursday or listen to the audio podcast once we get that rolled out. Uh, next Tuesday, we have... Um, Michael Craftsman, co-founder and CEO of Urbanbound. We have Matt Silver, co-founder and CEO of Forager. They just raised a bunch of money uh, coming on next Thursday. Uh, Tuesday, June 23rd, we have John and Seth, uh, CEO and president, respectively, of IDX Technologies. IDX is the first FDA-approved uh, AI and machine learning uh, medical device for diagnosing medical issues. So instead of having a doctor say, hey, you're diagnosed with ABCD, uh, there's a machine that they've created that does this. It's the future of medicine. It's gonna be a really interesting conversation. If you're interested in healthcare, check that one out for sure. Uh, we have our second jam session on the show, uh, June 25th. We have a head of people jam session. Shout out to all the HR people, talent acquisition, talent acquisition management people, uh, fighting the good fight through COVID. That's gonna be an interesting conversation. And last, but not least, June 30th, we have Brent Sopel, former NHL hockey player, former Stanley Cup champion in Chicago. Uh, most importantly, uh, the founder and CEO of the Brent Sopel Foundation, tackling children with dyslexia. Uh, definitely tune into that June 30th. On the show today, we have Samara Mejia Hernandez, founding partner of Chingana Ventures. Uh, Chingana Ventures was founded just a few months ago uh, with the focus of Funding Entrepreneurs from Underrepresented Backgrounds. Very timely conversation that we're going to be having with Samara, uh, Samara around that topic. Uh, prior to that, she was the venture partner at Math Venture Partners. Shout out to Troy Anikoff, who's live today. He was also our first guest on Fireside Chicago. Uh, prior to her venture capital career, she spent just under a decade in institutional sales at Goldman Sachs. Ladies and gentlemen, Samara Mejia Hernandez. How's it going, Samara? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Thanks for having me. Right before we hit the record button, you were sharing a story. You have a little one at home, correct? Yeah. How yeah. old? Uh, 20 months. 20 oh. months. Yeah. Okay. So we have Samara that's working from home. She's got a 20 month old. Uh, what was the story you just said? Around, oh, <laughs> I, just had this morning? <laughs> I just had to take two showers this morning. My son was going outside and just was putting on sunblock uh, and he decided to just rub it all over my face and my hair and my clothes. So um, you know, he was trying to help me out as well, but uh, needed to to redo it's, everything again. It's the story of a parent, you know, it's a story of uh, the lockdown and COVID. I think we're all dealing with it in a certain degree, but uh, thank you for sharing that anecdote. So let's, let's just talk about, uh, maybe start off by talking about uh, your background. Um, you've, had, you've done a few things in your career. I definitely want to get into what you're doing with your current firm, but let's talk about your background a little bit. We'll get into some questions from there. Yeah, so um, so I, I guess I'll start in Mexico. I was born there. Uh, I came to the U.S. when I was young. Uh, so I had that traditional kind of me Mexican immigrant story. Uh, my parents worked minimum wage jobs. Um, I was in ESL, English as a second language, until fifth grade. Um, so I didn't excel in English, uh, but I did excel in math. And so that helped me um, get ahead in math uh, and then pursue an engineering degree at the University of Michigan. So I did that um, and I found Goldman Sachs in 04 and I was like, what do you guys do? I have no idea. I had no idea what Goldman Sachs did. Um, and so I uh, joined them back in 04, 05, uh, best time to be on Wall Street uh, or join and then um, joined them on full time 
for almost a decade across technology operations and sales. And so, um, you know, I sold during the last financial crisis, which was a huge learning experience going from engineering where you had to know the exact numbers to sales. Um, and you, you know, you obviously run a business all on sales and, and, and helping people with their sales and, and hiring. But um, that was a learning lesson for me on, on building trust and relationships and really solving a problem. So I had solved problems in engineering, but it was a different type of problem that I was solving for my customers. So I did that, um, went to Kellogg for my MBA, and that's where I took a class called VC Lab, where they put uh, students um, in firms that are doing early stage investing. There was VC, angel groups, PE, and then I guess now there's some startups, but it was my first exposure to early stage. Um, so I actually worked at a group here in Chicago, with which Tim, you know, because you're part of it now, but it's West Suburban Angels. So Joe gave me my first job there, and uh, I think I was their second intern, um, and I loved it. It was literally, um, you know, talking to founders, building the infrastructure of like how to assess a deal. I had dealt with public companies, public funds in the past, and this was my first time actually dealing with the private markets, and I loved working with founders super early. Um, and so I graduated Kellogg without a job. Uh, I went to 1871 and tried to talk to a bunch of founders to help me, you know, to, to have me help them with anything because I just wanted experience. So I helped with pitch decks, financial models, uh, getting on customer discovery calls. Uh, Nick Rosa at Sandbox Industries actually gave me my first project at a VC firm. Uh, and I still didn't have a job. I ended up going back to Goldman Sachs for a little bit because um, one of my former colleagues had started running a team and he knew I liked to grow and build things. Uh, so he hired me back on, um, but I was obviously still networking because I wanted to get a, a role in venture. And then uh, Mark Ackler and Troy Hanikoff had just uh, launched Fund One at Math Venture Partners. And so um, they were hiring and I got connected to them through Rumi Morales, who, who used to run CME Group, um, Vent CME Ventures, and then David Weinstein, and then, you know, found Mark and Troy. Uh, so I joined on uh, very early on at Math. Um, they took me on, and Dana Wright joined on as well. Um, and so I stayed with them for the last few years and fell in love with early stage investing. Um, I was given a platform to, you know, help grow um, in my own investing skills and, and um, I did see a lack of uh, diversity in, in tech and in, in, in the investor world. Um, so I saw an opportunity to, to uh, not only mentor founders, because I had done that and, and I have done office hours for the last you know, five years. That's something that actually Troy um, uh, did and, and I copied him. Um, but I, invest, I, I did a lot of office hours and I would partner with women tech founders and I would partner with the Latinx incubator. And I was like, there's only so much advice that they need. These, these founders really need capital. And these were, these were businesses that were growing. And a lot of these businesses were going out to the coast to get funding. And they were, they were actually, you know, they were getting funded and they were growing. And so um, I, that's where the idea of Chingona Ventures started. Um, and I launched it last year, uh, almost a year, actually just over a year ago. I've made 10 investments in the fund. Um, I go earlier than most, so pre-seed when companies have raised less than a million in outside funding. Um, my check size is anywhere from 100,000 to 250,000. Um, I'm industry agnostic, but areas I really like are FinTech, Future of Work, FemTech, uh, Food, FoodTech, Health and Wellness, and EdTech. And I invest all over the United States, not just the Midwest, but I'm based here. I'm a sole GP and general partner in the fund, but I have great Kellogg interns that, that help me. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a little bit about the fund. Um, Chingona means badass woman in, in Spanish. So I'm investing in badass founders uh, and looking to get outsized returns um, and find alpha and founders that are traditionally overlooked. So talk about that last part, finding founders that are traditionally overlooked. If you check out your website, there's a stat there that uh, only 3% of all venture capital funding goes towards not just one group, but two groups, wi uh, women founders and people of color founders. Mm -hmm. And I thought that to be a, a shocking statistic might make sense, 
but uh, let's let's uncover that a little bit. So what what's the the current landscape uh, for venture capital? Maybe describe that a little bit and how you're differentiating that landscape with your firm. Yeah, so you know, I think there has been some progress around investing in in women. Uh, not, you know, there's no hockey stick growth or enough um, because, you know, um, but there has been some more in terms of women partners coming into firms. You've seen that on some of the, you know, the bigger funds, not only in the Midwest but also all over the United States. Um, but particularly, people of color get less than one percent. The stat was like. 0.006%. It's not even a rounding error, which is which is crazy. And that's reflected at the leadership levels at many funds. So uh, I do believe there is a direct correlation between um, who's investing and who's writing checks, who's leading these funds, and actually who's getting um, you know funded. Pre, I guess, the last three months, um, you know, we started to see some initiatives and some organizations launching. You started to see a lot of uh, funds, uh, people going off on their own, like myself and, and like me, like you know, raising another fund. But um, a lot of these funds tend to be smaller in nature to start because they need to prove a track. They need to have a track record to go on and raise bigger funds. Um, you know, more recently, we had scheduled this call weeks ago, um, but more recently, you've started to see a lot more discussion around, particularly um, black and brown communities, particularly black communities and founders that are often overlooked. Um, and, you know, there's some kind of questions and, and theories around that, and there's a lot of discussion around it. Uh, but, you know, I have made it a point to be intentional about where I get my deal flow. And I have made a point and be, to be intentional about who I'm, uh, the advisors around me, who I'm hiring internally, who um, I'm connecting with in terms of investors, to, to try to see more deals that aren't getting funded. And, um, and you know, I'm not only investing in women and minorities, I do have white men in the portfolio. My whole thesis is that, you know, if you can get, uh, if you can see deals that others might pass in the early stages, um, if you can help these founders get to the next stage in their business, whether it's fundraise, funding and, uh, fundraising for a new round of funding, um, getting their first customer, uh, making their first couple hires. You know, for me, it's going earlier. It's higher risk, um, but hopefully higher return. And I believe I can help founders in a very different way. And um, I, that is different from a lot of VC funds because um, I am going earlier, so pre-seed. Um, and it is different in the sense of the founders I'm looking at because many of these founders haven't gotten access to capital and they have very, very different struggles than other founders. I mean, starting a business is hard enough, but other obstacles that you have to overcome as a woman or minority, um, when you're pitching on the other side of the table to people that look very different from you, uh, you know, whether it's a woman um, just, you know, being a woman or, 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 or being pregnant in the, in the room or, um, having to pitch something where it's a market that's that's huge and it's growing, but these investors don't understand um, because they haven't been there or lived it, or you know, not that you have to use the product to invest, but um, you know, they haven't tried to understand it, or um, you know, it, or other founders that maybe haven't had the opportunity to pitch a lot of investors and don't know the lingo or don't know how to tell the story right, right? And so for me, it's 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 pushing the boundaries and pushing the status quo and, and going beyond, you know, just people coming to me um, and being very intentional about where I find these founders and hopefully the experience that they have with me so that they can refer me to their network. Um, and, um, and also with the companies that I, that I do invest in, most are diverse, but if, if they're not helping them hire their first woman or minority on the team and helping them get the compensation that, um, that they deserve for the work that they're doing. This is such an interesting conversation. It's, it's timely. My, my lens, you know, being in the recruitment industry, diversity and inclusion has been a, a, a topic, uh, a progressive topic for, you know, at least over the last decade. And a lot of the underlying issues that you'll see in a corporate environment are, um, hiring women and minorities into an organization that's majority white or 
uh, promotion of individuals uh, that are minorities into leadership. And when you dig deeper into that, it's um, do you have enough people on the team that have the opportunity to get into leadership? Do they see somebody that looks, acts, feels, thinks like them, or came from the same background that they did, that they can look to as a mentor? And that like, there's, there's so many different like pieces or variables uh, to kind of pick apart there. And I, I think that, you know, being in the human capital HR uh, industry, there, there has been a lot of movement there. In VC, when you see a, a stat of like only 3% are getting funded, you being someone on the inside and taking a different approach, what are some of the reasons behind that? Are there a lot of founders that are looking for capital that are going to these meetings and just can't get it? Are there just not a lot of founders that have the resources, the education in order to do it? Like what, what are some of the things that you're seeing um, are causing maybe some of these statistics that, that we're talking about? Yeah. So the, there, there's two parts to that. So I think the first part is on the investor side, right? There's not enough investors um, that start their own funds and raise a significant amount um, and then can in turn invest it back into certain types of, of founders. And and there's a lot of, especially at the early stages, unconscious bias that happens. I don't care who you are. I have a, you have it, everyone has it. Um, and you're more likely to invest in people in your network, people that look like you, industries that you know and understand and that you're a part of. Uh, I've seen it, I've seen it with myself, I've seen it with other people. So a lot of, historically, a lot of the people that have started funds or have had the, the income to start these funds or just to do, um, angel investing, get a certain track record to then start their own funds have been white men. Um, and, uh, you know, some like, uh, you know, Mark and Troy at math who were allies early on, um, were very intentional about hiring their first woman or, or making sure that, you know, the team was diverse. Um, but many are just not and, and or historically haven't been. And um, it's not enough to just say, okay, we're going to hire a first woman, check the box, and we're done, and not, uh, or person of color, right, and not mentor them and not give them the experiences to be on boards, to lead deals, right? Um, actually, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the first panel I did, it was like a month into working at math, and Troy put me on it because he was like, it's all white guys, and I'm not going to do it with all white guys, right? So you need to speak up. And so to your point, um, you know, people want to see differentiated voices um, on, on different platforms and, and to be like, oh, okay, there's a Latina on, in the fund or there, there's a woman here, you know, maybe I can do it too. And I didn't realize how important that was because I just, I never saw it. So I just was used to, okay, like in engineering at Goldman Sachs, you know, I was just used to a lot of white men mentoring me. Um, and I've had a ton of, uh, many of them become allies for me, and not only allies, but sponsors for me and actually fight for me. Um, so so I, I believe from the investor side, there's a lot of work to do. I think there's some initial like, okay, we've, we've hired one person, but that's not enough. And it's not enough to just have one, right? And so a lot of these people bring differentiated voices and ensuring that they can grow on your team. And then on the other part, on the founder side, it's hard enough to start a business. Um, it's hard enough to just to have a, a cushion and a safety net and leave your you know big corporate job, um, and to just you know start a business with nothing or to get um, some initial funding from angels and friends in your network. Many many of these founders have less of that capital, and with angels that you know just know you and you have no track record, you haven't you might have an idea and can actually write a check into your company or into you. So, you know, with me, I was very intentional about going a lot earlier to invest in these founders that didn't have that friends and family network that can do that. So that's kind of where it starts. And then it's like, okay, well, maybe I have some initial traction or, or initial validation. And I've seen so many founders then say, all right, I'm gonna go pitch to VCs. Do, and a lot of these VCs require warm introductions. Um, and that's the first barrier, right? Because if they don't have access to this network of warm intros, then it's really hard for them to, to you know, reach out. And even if they go on their website, it's like, okay, the probability of you getting a response from a website is pretty low. There are some funds, interestingly enough, that have done this a long time before any of this you know, conversation uh, was amplified. 
uh, one fund in San Francisco, I kept seeing them on cap tables. I kept seeing founders, specifically founders of color, get funded from them. And I was like, who is this fund? And I looked at them and it's like a group of all white guys. And they're like, we just have a data-driven approach. So we purposely don't take any warm introductions, not because they're focused on minority founders, like that's just, just our thesis. And so the founders literally go on the website and they have to put in their traction, their numbers, their round size. Um, and they've, they've been able to get a lot of investments um, into these founders just by using data, not even you know meeting them or, or requiring a warm introduction. So I think part of that for me, I changed my website to, to have more of that um, and rely less on, on warm introductions. Obviously, a warm introduction is always better, and you know you take, you know you, you might take the meeting, um, you know uh, you might consider the, the company differently if it's a close friend that introduces you. But um, I make sure that my investor network is filled with white guys, but also you know minorities and people of color all over the United States. Um, and then also on the founder side, what I've seen um, with women many times uh, is is you know, getting different terms, getting a lot of times lower valuations. Um, I just heard of a, a woman recently that, that um, because of COVID, uh, the, the investor just waited two months and now is giving them like crazy terms, much lower valuation, a lot of other, I'm not going to, you know, kind of go into it, but a lot of other terms that are just like ridiculous, right? And sh they know that she's been waiting on this and she can't get funding. And so they're kind of taking advantage of this. Right. And so, so I see a lot more of that. Um, and uh, the last thing on that is I, and we, I talked about this recently with a group of investors is that um, one of my colleagues, Monique Woodard um, in San Francisco said, you know, a lot of these founders are over mentored and under invested. And I realize that that's true. Many people, you know, are happy to mentor them in workshops, office hours, but when it comes to actually making an investment, I don't know if it's the founders not asking for or the VCs not, you know, taking the time to actually look at the pitch from a different lens. But I see that over and over again. And I've talked to my founder friends and many of them are like, I've just had heard horror stories. I don't even want to try. And so they go elsewhere. So I think it ha it's, it's on both sides and there's organizations trying, but I'm right now particularly working with um, Get Cities. Uh, I just had a conversation with them this morning. Um, some other funds uh, outside of Chicago, some funds in the Midwest, some organizations in the Midwest to be more tact, have more, um, be more specific about how we're going to help investors and founders um, get to the root of the cause of what is actually driving this gap. I have a lot of thoughts, but, um, you know, until we actually start measuring them and start being very explicit about what we're doing, it's going to be hard to, to make a change. I, I think what you're doing is, is fantastic, spot on. It's timely. You're starting to see other funds start to take notice. SoftBank, which is the world's largest venture capital firm, uh, just dedicated $100 million to a fund uh, to, to essentially invest in founders of, um, you know, minority backgrounds uh, as well. So you're starting to see this, this progress, but everything that you're talking about, you know, when you hear it, it's, it's so spot on. Uh, getting warm introductions typically comes from friends, family, people that you worked with, and you don't think about it, but you know, they tend to look like you, come from the same background, maybe there was a college friend or something along those lines. Um, and then there's this, this cycle, you know, you and I talked about it in our, on our prep call, you know, founder has, I won't say privilege, but has, has the variables that allow him or her to found a company, which is typically you have some experience that gives you some confidence, you've made some money along the way to maybe fund some things for yourself, or you mentioned it, you have some friends and family that can kind of help you out. Mom and dad give you some money, you know, rich uncle Rick gives you some money because they believe in this, this, this nephew kind of thing. You know, founder starts to see some success, has mentors around he or she, becomes successful, you know, um, exits that organization or that, that company and is wealthy and then puts that wealth back into this cycle and then who do they invest in? Who do they fund? Who are they getting warm introductions? The individual that used to work for 
them is starting a company, though the money goes there. And you're kind of seeing this cycle, which, which makes sense. And if, you know, I, I think, you know, I don't want to take anything away from myself. I work my butt off my entire career. Uh, I've been socking money away to start my own company for a really long time. But, you know, when I really look at it, you know, my, uh, mom and dad sent me to a Big Ten university. You know, they had the ability to do so. And I learned so much there. I made such great connections. I joined an organization. I've had every opportunity to have the landscape in order to be successful. And then, um, you know, when I look at all my counterparts that are founders of companies as well, it's a, it's a similar story. There is a systemic thing going on with this that I think you've uncovered that more people are waking up to, um, no doubt. Any, any final thoughts on just this topic in general before we get into other areas? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, one of my colleagues um, in New York at Harlem Capital posted something on Twitter where he was like, when was the first time you experienced racism? And then, you know, a bunch of people commented, and of course, I could think of my first story. And, and uh, I was having some discussions with some colleagues, and one of them was like, I've never experienced it. I was like, what? And she, she's white, you know, from the South. And I was like, I had what's it like not to experience racism? I have no idea because, you know, that was just from the first moment we came to the United States, you know, it was in my parents coming home crying from work because of that and, and not be able to speak up because they were going to get fired and we couldn't, you know, pay for our rent. Um, and, uh, you know, what's it like not being able to worry about your, your parents getting deported. And so you have to speak, you not say anything and, and hide, you know, in your home and not play outside too much. And what's it like not having to worry about your, um, your family getting shot in the street just because of the way they look, it, you know? It, and so there, there's so many things that, that um, certain communities have to face. And, and, you know, um, even with, from the founding perspective, uh, it, many of my colleagues talk about this, but, but, with COVID, it's hit communities uh, of the, the of African American communities, and in Chicago, seventy percent of them, uh, of the communities that uh, of seventy percent of all cases that resulted in deaths were from the African American community. Mm -hmm. Fifty percent of all COVID cases are from uh, Latino community, and um, it, it's hitting us harder than than others, right? And so, it, it's it's just a different thing, and I don't. You know, I can't speak for my, my black friends, obviously. Um, I can speak from it, from the Latino community. But what I do know is that is, is, is starting to realize a certain privilege that, you know, some of us have and all of us have really, and using the platform to, to speak up about it, one, um, to acknowledge that you, your, where your organization is in terms of hiring, in terms of investing, and then really make a change if that's what you're committed to doing, because we have seen a lot of VC funds and other corporations um, obviously denounce uh, racism, but then, you know, then you look at the organization and you look at who's at the top and, it, and you know, it's very clear who's running the company. And so um, there have been organizations like Ben and Jerry's who have just been super explicit about their, their viewpoint. And there's been others that, you know, you know, have been somewhere around, you know, not saying anything at all to kind of, you know, we denounce this. Uh, so I think everyone's just trying to figure out like, what do I say? What do I do? What's my privilege? What have I experienced? What have others experienced? And I think it's really important to just start the conversation. Um, and particular in VC, I think it's really important to look at your own organization and even at the startup world, right? And say like, who do we have on the team? Um, What's the breakdown, not just by women, but also by people of color? Um, are we doing, do we want to, to, to change? And if we do, let's start um, getting those numbers together, right? Numbers don't lie. So tell, telling the, the story of, of who's in your organization and then making a conscious effort to say, all right, what are we gonna do now? And if it's working like you, with you for hiring, it's making sure that you get diverse candidates right, in your organization. Um, I don't know how many actually ask um, about diverse hiring. I don't know how many people actually ask, um, you know, you to be explicit about who's in your pipeline or, or what candidates you refer to them. But I think it's really important to, to be really intentional about it. Yeah, I, I could speak to that. I don't think enough organizations are thinking in that context, especially early stage companies yeah. where, 
if you're going to, if you have the vision to scale a company, which typically means that you're going to start to hire a lot of people over however many years, you know, so if you have a founding team of two to three to four, it's, it's most important to start at that stage early to start look at diversity hiring initiatives, because once you're 50 people in or a hundred people or a thousand people, it's really hard to change that dynamic and culture. Most, you mentioned taking warm introductions, most hiring at the early stage tech companies that we work with goes by way of referral, right? Yeah. I know somebody, I went to college with them, I went to high school with them, they're a referral from my best friend. And you're right, it's all, you know, typically it's, it's gonna be the same, you know, demographic that's, so I, I, I wouldn't empower organizations to start early with that. Um, that would mean that more, uh, folks from different backgrounds are gonna get into leadership roles early on into that. That means that more individuals that are candidates are gonna accept those job offers when they see people that uh, look or act or feel or have the same backgrounds as him or she. Um, they're gonna take those, those jobs and then they're gonna feel you know, comfortable enough to be themselves. And I think it's, you know, what we're talking about is a cycle, not just in venture capital or business, but just in the, the nation itself. And I think I can speak for myself, I'm, uh, uh, obviously thinking a lot more about this topic. And it's, it's great to see that you're making such a, uh, such of an impact. And you're right. We booked this conversation weeks ago, uh, really before all this, and this couldn't, this couldn't be any more timely. Um, I wanted to hit on a couple other things before we let you go. Um, This is a Chicago based uh, show. You know, most, uh, all of our attendees are Chicago based. They have an interest in business or professional development. You know, the Chicago tech ecosystem got hit pretty hard with COVID, uh, with layoffs, especially, you know, depending on where you were at in the fundraising cycle. Um, If you were just about to raise a fund or raise a round or you're raising money in 2020, you got kind of caught off guard by this situation and we're we're being impacted. It's affecting jobs. Um, You know, you mentioned that you're seeing, uh, companies on the coast that you invest in. Uh, You've been at Goldman Sachs. You've been in the venture space for a long time. How does Chicago compare to the coasts or maybe specifically Silicon Valley in your eyes? And where where are we going in the future? What are some of the things that we need to do as an ecosystem to really thrive? Yeah. So Chicago has been growing there since I've been in venture. There's been so many new funds coming to the market. Funds have been uh, bigger funds have been raised, right? Fund one, fund two, fund three. Um, so I've seen that positive, um, you know, trend. I've seen organizations and accelerators launching, new accelerators launch, launching to bring in more founders. So that's a positive trend. Um, it's not as mature as obviously areas like Silicon Valley, LA, well, LA still growing, but New York. Um, it still lags behind those indus- those um, markets. And where I see that take into effect is in particularly in the super early stages and then in, in the later stages. So in the super early stages, when um, companies have or, or, or fun or companies are starting and they need angel money, um, you see in this in the valley, it's like it's almost like people brag about you know, they're angel investing or they were the first in so-and-so in Uber and, and so, so it's like, it's like a status symbol almost. Where in Chicago, you don't have that. Um, and I don't know if you have enough angel investors. I think the people that know the angel investors, the big ones are like, okay, there's, there's probably a handful that you see um, that can write million dollar checks or even above, you know, a hundred thousand. So I, I feel like we're starting to see a little bit more of that and we will continue to see that as we have exits which will in turn will help our early stage ecosystem where they can in turn invest that money you know, back in. Um, I think we should have more of that. I'm actually advising a group called Angeles um, here in Chicago. It's a group of Latino founder, Latino executives put, wanting to put money into early stage companies. So, so far they've invested um, in, in two of my companies, but uh, I feel like we need to have more of that. Uh, High Park Angels has done a great job over the last few years and I think you're going to start to see more angel groups as well come into the market. Now, where it also impacts on the later stage side, many um, funds in Chicago have done, you know, traditional seed or Series A. When it comes down to time to a bigger Series B, C, and D, you start to see them start to then need to go out to go on, need to go to the coast to raise a fifty million dollar round, right? 
And, um, you know, I, I wonder what if we had a growth stage fund in Chicago that just focused on the Midwest companies. Um, so I had that conversation with a lot of uh, my investor friends. It's like, is there an opportunity? Is there a white space for someone to come in here? Some of the bigger names that traditionally were able to write some of these checks are either no longer around or their funds aren't, you know, um, as big anymore. And so we need to have more drive capitals within Ohio that can write some of these bigger checks, but I think they focus earlier. So um, that's where I see the white space. And also with that white space, you start um, to see people, funds that have been investing haven't necessarily seen the exits like the, the Googles and the Ubers and the Facebooks. And so they might be traditionally a little bit more conservative. So you, you see a lot of um, companies here need to have more traction, more validation, more up into the right graphs that Troy always talks about uh, here. Whereas in the Valley, you, start, you, you see a lot of companies um, that are able to raise money more on a PowerPoint deck, like in the million to $4 million range and, and more. Um, so there's less risky capital. So it's harder for founders to like get that capital early on to start getting that validation that you, so that they can get um, a venture investment in the community. But again, I think that will start to change as we um, start to mature a little bit more. It's, it's interesting. If you look at Silicon Valley, it's what, what you just hit on in a, a few different variables. Uh, you know, big exits leads to a lot of people with maybe cash in their pockets uh, that can reinvest that cash into the ecosystem or other founders, and then which creates more exits and then more capital back into the ecosystem, so on and so forth. I, I, lo I look at it from a, a jobs and like a, a macro economic standpoint. The more jobs that we can keep that are good jobs and like the future is technology, there's a reason that the NASDAQ rebounded right before the rest of the stock market. Uh, yep. Everything's moving to the cloud, uh, go for technologies, they're disrupting different industries that are essentially going out of business. We need those technology jobs in Chicago. I think it's awesome that Uber and Facebook and Google and Amazon planted roots in Chicago and hired a bunch of people in Chicago, Glassdoor, I think that's fantastic. But we need more Chicago kind of native grown companies to really kind of start that cycle. You don't, you don't want to be a um, Dayton, Ohio and see the, the industries that were great 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, just kind of go away and get disrupted. Right. We yeah. can't, we can't have that. And it's, I, you know, until I, I left my previous organization, I didn't realize the impact that like the capital side of this equation has on, on everything. Oh. And uh, it's, yeah. it all starts with the capital, right? No, exactly. That's exactly it. Um, so we are seeing companies like Cameo, right? Companies like uh, Project 44 Project, um, and some others that are starting to get some validation, starting to get some coastal money to really grow and scale. Uh, some of them will be guests on your show too. So um, I see a positive trend um, and I would love to have minorities and women as part of that equation as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Samara. Yeah. Uh, Chingano Ventures. Um, if you're a, a founder looking to raise capital, uh, reach out. Um, if you're a potential in a position to be a limited partner, reach out to Samara. Samara, if, if folks are interested in, in reaching out and, and finding you, where can they find about, out about your firm and where can they reach you? Yeah, so uh, chingona.ventures is the website. Um, and you could just email me at samara at chingona.ventures. Uh, if you can't remember that, uh, it's, you can just go on my website and I respond to most emails. That sounds great. Thank you so much for the time, Samara. Thank you. Mm -hmm.